see most of the human race killed off because it is unworthy. It is unworthy of the gift of life. I don't care what society thinks. They're nothing anyway. They're no better than me. Until we hear the safe word, we will not stop. Have you ever thought what it would be like to see a person's head amputated? Think of things so horrible that the human mind cannot imagine them. See all this and more when you see on stage, in person, that crazy mix of I like being set apart from people. I like to be hated. Safe word with Jason Rouse. Hey, this is Jason Rouse, and welcome to the Safe Word Podcast on the show. Ken Collette is here in Hess Village. Uh, I fucked it up. I called you by your brother because, well, first of all, <clears throat> you, you and your brother have been uh, business partners, what, fuck, since, like, high school? Since uh, 1988. Since 1988? Yeah. And, uh, well, you've got to be my age. What are you, almost 50? Are you 50? Uh, no, I'll be 58 in October. In 58 in October, yeah. okay. So th- there's, there's, uh, oh, I hold uh you. 10, 10 year. I'll be 49 in December. Oh, you're almost 50, eh? Almost 50. <laughs> it doesn't bother me. No. You know, like I said, like, you, you, you laughed when I, uh, like, you're... A decade older than me, but um, you're smiling. Yeah. You're, you're out during the day. No kids. Well, once you're fifty, you're no longer you're no longer middle aged, right? You're on your way down. Right? Is it down, really? Yeah. Well, yeah. Don't we do a hundred and twenty? You're, you're gonna live to hundred and twenty. I'm gonna do it out of spite. I wanted to check <laughs> out years ago, you know, and we'll we'll get to that. But uh, I I should announce some dates. I'm doing some shows. I think nice. probably the only comic in in the world right now that has a my tour schedule uh, first of all I had like spent three months like usually around November December is when I'll start to reach out to international uh, bookings and stuff like that I know that they work in like six to month eight month increments so I gotta kind of plant some seeds of just to save some dough on like because I don't want to fly through three countries the same three countries before I have to go and do that city, you know what I mean? So yeah. there's, there's a bit of pre-planning going on. So I spend a good 90 days you negotiating, you know, working out. I do everything myself. And then things are kind of coming to uh, fruition by January. And uh, I was pretty stoked. It was like Switzerland, Sweden, Finland, Norway. I think there was going to be Poland and Germany. I was going to cram in as many countries as I could in, in one month because I'd been so starved of just traveling, just right. being locked into the States for six months at a time with my green card. Yeah. Um, put me into a, a, a... I was doing these more sprints. I was exhausted when I got home. Most of the times I was sick just from the flighting. You right. know, I was trying to be active and eat mm-hmm. right, but getting a falafel at 4 a.m. In, in Slovenia... <laughs> you know, and and, it, and I haven't had a drink in almost four years now. So it was like this Mardi Gras traveling funk band in and around. It was it was destroying me. I literally was so relieved the time I got back to L.A. and had nothing to do. Like I couldn't do anything because I wasn't the spots that were available at the comedy store or the Laugh Factory or the improv. I was competing with Bill Burr. You know, Russell Peters and fucking... A, a laundry list of millionaires. Yeah. Millionaires. A-list. Millionaires. Yeah. Legends. <laughs> and, uh, and and being, you know, on a, a kind of like a... Uh, what do you say? a uh, Like a bread line almost. Waiting my turn to be picked right. to go and perform uh, on this prestigious stage. So the time that I had off in uh, in L.A. was... Uh, a, a kind of like <clears throat> look at February in California and having nothing to do as a Canadian is kind of nice. Right. Like people are like, oh, this is too hot. About the-. you hear people are shitty travelers that will complain about service and Canadians are like, shut up, there's orange trees. <laughs> you, <laughs> yeah. you know, it's like there's Christmas songs and orange trees, but you, on the other hand, stayed in this city in yeah. 88 stars was that the first that's a pretty 
1986. I was, 86. I was 24. Was... I opened Grand Slam batting cages in Burlington. Grand Slam decided I'm never going to get any pussy at a batting cage. <laughs> That's like the world's worst lesbian bar is a batting cage. I was a baseball player. Ah. Right? And I, you know, I had experience working for other people and it wasn't going too well. So, you know, I borrowed $20,000 off my dad. Yeah. My my best friend at the time in high school, he borrowed 20000 off his dad, and we opened a batting cage, and we thought we were going to be rich. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it didn't turn out so well, you know. We, oh, it was it was taking a bath? Because well, batting cages uh, in the 80s was a thing. Well, yeah, actually, we got a liquor license there as well, and, you know, it was really busy in the summertime, but in the wintertime, when we thought yeah, we'd be seasonal. busy, yeah. it, it wasn't busy. So I yeah. had to work full-time in Toronto, and I had to work at the batting cage. Did you start to begrudge people that you seen with like baseball attire, but had never really even come to the cages? You're like, well, I didn't understand why everybody, you know, because I love batting cages so much. I didn't understand why it, yeah. everybody didn't want to come to the batting cage. Were you in your twenties? Yeah, I was twenty four. Okay, and a, and a baseball. That's player. an honest mistake as a twenty four <laughs> yeah. year old guy. But two years Who later, want to play baseball. <laughs> everybody likes baseball. Two years later, some guy came in, came in to see me and. Um, he ended up being my business partner. Uh, he said, there's a, there's a banquet hall next door. Do you want to open up a teen club? Yeah. I said, sure. Oh, what was the one on the mountain? Uh, a high school cafe. I don't know. I never went there. was a teen club. It. it was the high school cafe in Hamilton. This is probably like 86. Right. And it was at my, you know, I was in a downtown Hamilton, you know, street kid yeah. hanging out at Beasley Park breaking windows. And then go up to these this teen dance, which is just look. What is it, Nicholas Piccolis? Yeah, right. Yeah, with no booze, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, with a guy by the name Nicholas Piccolis, Piccolis. Yeah, from CFMY. Yeah. With CMY, uh, the amount of slurred conversations from me to him, I I've had uh, leering over a DJ booth. Yeah. Uh, anyway, well, those were the stars of our time, right? The radio, radio sure. guys were stars. Sure, right? and, and definitely, I'm going to save it for near the end, but uh, just so I don't fucking fold. But uh, Martin Streak, you right. know, the only person without he would giggle when I try to talk him out of it. He he put me on live radio. Who would even let me near a microphone? Yeah. And he go, oh, it's going to be fun. Oh, it's going to be fun. Yeah. Come, come, come! Shh. <laughs> just wait till the commercials. Anyway. Uh, teen dances decide very lucrative. At that in that period, there wasn't a lot of nightclubs. There wasn't anything for young kids to do. Yeah, and is so, this in the same space as the batting cages? No, it was so next door. It. it was oh, next okay. door. So the batting cage was still there. So we opened Star. This is a warehouse area, if I remember correctly. No, it's on Plains Road. Yeah. It, it was like a funny building, and it had a big, huge banquet hall, and that's yeah. what we took over. It was 10,000 square foot banquet hall. We turned it into a teen club and we had the kids from Burlington come from. Uh, Called Kids with Money. Nine till one o'clock and then we kicked them all out. And then the Jane and Finch crowd came in after we had an after hours club, like a really, really tough crowd. We had to bring in a whole set of different doormen from Toronto. <laughs> you got came from Toronto and the Burlington police. Were yeah. There. They were going, who, how, who are these young were you kids? Were you sure alcohol? Or was this no, a it DJ just, and just a space? DJ, it was space to dance. Yeah. Board, board some money off a leasing could, company. Could people smoke cigarettes in there at that time? Oh, yeah. Yeah, you could smoke <laughs> yeah. cigarettes in, in a Yeah, we, we, had, we had like a wooden dance floor with carpet around it. And the, car, <laughs> the carpet ended up... You know, the getting, fire hazard. Yeah, it was like full of burn holes, right? Fuck. We used to rent this laser and we'd plug it right into the into, into the 220 box, right? Because back then, you know, it was we had pyro. Yeah. We had all kinds yeah, of stuff yeah, that yeah, you yeah. can't do There's now. no health inspector... No, not really no health inspector. You know, the fire inspector was kind of all over us. Yeah. And we, we ended up developing a nice relationship with the police. We really did. And uh, Well, you had to because there was, you know, by the end of it, eventually, which came Kingdom, I think that was the last time that you'd owned it. Yeah, we sold it in 95. But in 88, my brother came to work with me. We became partners then. And he had all kinds of... He shows of, up. He what did your brother say? Of, he had all kinds of... We, we got to do this and we got to do that. Yeah. So we opened a, a modeling agency. He said, we got to open a modeling agency. When you agency. said you did your impression of your brother, did you guys fight? Uh, back, <laughs> yeah, we're brothers, right? But, you know, we love each other. And, uh, yeah, we obviously... You know, yeah. We complimented each other, right? That's a tough gig. I was uh, the devil's advocate. And, you know, he, he was always throwing ideas out there. Yeah. So we, we had this teen club, so we thought, let's open a modeling agency. We can open a modeling school. You know, we, we had a feeder, right? Yeah. 
and we ended up having a, a modeling agency in downtown Toronto for for a bit. But that's tough business, and you know, I, I really didn't enjoy that business too much. Yes. It's kind of like no. uh, it's kind of creepy business. It was creepy people involved, but we brought in this video wall, and we used to rent out video walls for fashion shows. We ended up doing a, a, a fashion show for the Joe Brand Hospital, and that's how we developed a relationship with the police. So, uh, you, know, okay. you know, once we got involved with the community, yeah we, we, yeah, we threw a fashion show. We did a really nice job. The local cable company covered it, and, uh, you know, we gave $10,000 to the hospital. And then it went from there. In 91, you know, we closed the teen club, and we opened NRG in that spot. And a year later... In the same building? Yeah. Okay. Well, the same spot where Star yeah. Stars was it was NRG, and then the batting cage we turned that into the Amazon room. Ah, uh, right. And what did the sorry like? Because that the only time I've ever seen that place is with the lights off. Right. So I don't know what horror show you had when the fucking lights so, come out because I knew it was very industrial. It wasn't very 50, attractive. Fifty foot high ceiling. Yeah, it's the like ceilings 50. were high. We used to go on the top of the ceiling, take the skylights off, so all the heat would come out. You know, yeah, we had this perfect air conditioning system. That's we, right. We put, I think there was we, an announcement. You guys, there's people <laughs> dropping like flies all over the dance floor. Well, we used floor. to have. Uh, we're gonna open the, the steam, roof. The steam used to. <sighs> the steam used to come out of the roof. You, you yeah. See this? It was uh, insane. Yeah, we did a lot of... So what, what are we talking here? Because this was just like a huge cube. And not to mention, for a long time, you had maybe four, six, eight cages with naked... Not naked. Not naked, no. It was actually... It was well Tasteful. Done. It was tasteful. The it girl, was tasteful. We had both male and female go-go dancers. And that yes. was a thing back then, right? That was not a thing they, back then. Was it? Yeah, it was a thing back then. Because CNC Music Factory. We got that... We got that... <laughs> I, we went to New York City and they were doing that in New York City. At the Red Room, or, there was a club I went to. It was like, oh, I there, see. There it. was Webster's Hall. Uh, yeah. You know, it was an interesting scene back then. We got a lot of our ideas in Mexico. We got a uh -huh. lot of our ideas in New York City. Well, you also yeah. dropped money from the ceiling. Yes, we did. Yeah. You dropped a lot of money yes. from the ceiling, literally cash. Yes. <laughs> I got Guns N' Roses tickets for pulling yeah. out my dick in a cage. So the funny thing is, you know, <laughs> we stopped doing that money drop because our busboy um, would go up in the ceiling and put our, put balloons and money in. We do do the drop, and then he forgot to take away the, the wooden beam that he would lean on. So when we pulled the string, the beam came down and hit somebody right in the forehead. Oh no! <laughs> yeah. Oh no! Oh yeah! The guy, the guy's looking up in the air. And yeah, the boom, yeah, yeah. Nail right in the forehead. Just, Thank God he wasn't seriously hurt, but, you know, that was our first lawsuit. Right? Yeah, I was going to say, yeah. just because of how Wild West that place was. It was Wild West. And it wasn't short of, like, you, I know you, there was this heavy security presence. Oh, yes. You had some giant yes. people. Oh, and we also had the local police. They were at yeah. the front door every night. So. Yeah, you had to. Because you knew that, that you can't mix Hamilton people with Burlington people. I think we were, like, the originators of pay-duty police, like, you know, for, for, yeah. for events, right? Yeah. Yeah, well, you realize the fact that they're more of an asset than, yes. than a liability because... One the of the problems are on the outside instead of on the inside, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, young kids, you know, back in those days, they would show up, you know, and... A uh, lot of tough and kids. And when, when they left, you know, they were always, they were all fired up and... Yeah. Stuff happens, right? There's, yeah, always, yeah. there's always bad eggs. Yeah. And everything. Especially you when you put that many... You know, right. young people in a in a room. Not yeah. Again, it was it, you know going to Burlington was like a culture shock at where, where I grew up. You know, from East End to Hamilton to go up to Burlington, these girls had all their teeth. <laughs> Martin used to call it Girlington. <laughs> Girlington. I'm like, none of these girls have been in a fist fight. <laughs> they're like soft, pleasant. Yeah. You know, they're like, hi, how are you? And then, you know, I've been spit on by women right. on the Beeline bus. They were maybe brought up for a little, looking maybe too a much. little differently, yeah. Yeah, they, these girls, they're like kind of even better than girls from Westdale. That's what, how I looked at it. Westdale was I thought the, Westdale the was, was, was going to be as about, I thought like they, they were nice, they always smelled nice, yeah. but they dressed like hippies, but all their shit was brand new. <laughs> you know, this is pre grunge. Yeah. And um, I was like, they look like they're dressed like slobs, but they smell fantastic. <laughs> the girls in the, you know, 
Parkdale area smell like bingo daughters and fucking pepper spray. <laughs> You're getting a different type of lady there. I had a whole adjustment meeting girls. Whereabouts in Hamilton did you grow up? Ottawa and Barton. Right. You know. Yeah, um, yeah. It actually, it's getting a little. Re- it's getting revitalized there a little bit. It totally is. The but then it gets dark. dark. Yeah, that's the thing. Dark, yeah. Every time I'm walking up the Jolly Cut, I look over. Oh, there's a factory. There's a great lake. You can see a major city over yeah. there. There's a tons it's of a beautiful, green, it's beautiful, a beautiful spot. And then a junkie will stumble out of the bushes <laughs> and throw off that's in front like of my Barton face. That's like Barton and Sanford. That's where you, yeah. you, you guarantee some uh, some action down there at Barton and Sanford. You know? That has been probably one of the most that's the consistent, hardest. consistently Hamilton streets. Right. There's just dirt on everything. Right. The children have just got <laughs> hockey pucks of pollution in the corner. No, wait, you're talking about late at night after ten o'clock? Yeah. The freaks come out in that and totally. Yeah. You got a lot of free range psychos. Like yeah. I've lived in Los Angeles for thirteen years and what's that what's that uh, they're talking about the homeless a lot on the neighborhood. Oh I think what's that like? I think there are probably seventy thousand homeless people. That's a lot. That's a lot. It's are a they lot. all it's congregated disgusting. in one area? They, look it it it, it, it I, look Downtown Los Angeles looks like the fucking purge. This is this is eight months previous to all this right. COVID. So when did that start happening? Downtown Los Angeles. Yeah. I think it's always been a hub for like just heavy drug users, and they come up into the, where the money is in Hollywood. Sometimes yeah. they walk all the way into Beverly Hills. Well, I guess the weather's good too, right? So you can lay, you can you could sleep out on the fucking road, and they right. do. They shit in pizza boxes. Right. I literally. Was would make you know I juxtapose kind of graphic things with Hello Kitty to make this Jason Rouseisms and shitting in a pizza box. Right, is something I've done at parties. And when you see someone else <laughs> do your bit, uh. it really gets under <laughs> yeah. your skin. You know, I'm a resentment. Yeah, I'm like this guy's a fucking hack. I'm the shit pizza box guy. I've done it. They're stealing my stuff. They're stealing my stuff. The bastards. But no, definitely disgusting. Blood, piss, and shit all over the right. sidewalks. And uh, to this day, You'd I've You wonder why driven. these people aren't getting COVID, eh? Well, this is the thing. They have an immune system and that's Oh, the for charts. the roof. Also, ringworm, fucking gout, you yeah. know, rickets. Uh, uh, what, 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 how old do you think these people are? Is there like a? Is it all over the map? Or? Oh, yeah, definitely. You've got everything from like old school elderly mental patients yeah. to like teenage failed actors slash heroin right. addicts. And uh, there's, you can go on YouTube. Occasionally, I'll, I'll go on and just pull up latest downtown Los Angeles outbreaks, and you'll see um, it's scary. Like, I, I'd taken a bus from Vegas, just, I was like, fuck it, how bad, you know, the drive up there is, uh, you know, five hours. The bus can't be that bad. I've taken a bus to Toronto, I've been taking buses in, in and around Ontario. And uh, when they pulled into the bus station in downtown Los Angeles, my Hamilton antenna yeah. went right up to the top. And I was like, oh, fuck. It's like 4 a.m. And I see all these cars. Somebody told me that they there's a guy that picks people up in a, a fake cab, robs them, and then makes them walk back to the bus depot naked. And uh, there's, he says, oh, there's another one. They come in every week. Just people, he just robbed them at gunpoint. Like, it's, it is a, a disaster. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. And yet, it has a New York, you know, Manhattan vibe to it. Because it's the only place in the city that has large-scale buildings. So I'm talking to you, and this is based on your experience. Like why, don't, why don't you think the mainstream media is covering this? Covering the homelessness? Yeah. <sighs> because it's almost like, well, that's what they deserve. It's Hollywood. You know what I mean? They don't look at it as a, a um, any, like, Hollywood is the epicenter of build it up and tear it down. And when you see apocalyptic uh, living conditions and then the, these castles that these people live on, it's the most separation from wealth. And, right. and so it's so like... So there's no empathy for these people. No, like, there's no real place. There's no reality. It's either pure horror or decadence. There's no middle class. Right. And it's all celebrity. It's all... I call it goof city. Like, it, it is such a, um, a gross... 
a birthday cake. So have you ever walked through there to, to experience what's I walk going on there? all over the place. Like, I, I haven't driven a car ever. Right. So you, you, know? you walk through that area? Uh, I would never go to... I go occasionally, maybe You're once on a year. I, I'm in uh, Hollywood, right. right off Sunset Boulevard. So, like, I'm behind Man's Chinese Theater, which is like, you know, Hollywood Boulevard. And uh, it's like uh, the middle of it, more or less. And... Um, uh, yeah, I walk around fine, but I, I, I'm, you know, I'm. What I'm thankful for that I did grow up in this city, because it allowed me to uh, develop a sixth sense to environments that most people are not normal. Like I'm like many times I'll be out and I go, you guys need to step out of the way. Some shit is about to happen right right here. More times than not, yeah, I'm, I'm you right growing on. an understanding that the things psychology are, of are going to go down. Yeah, totally, and. Uh, you know, I feel bad. These Dutch families come over, like these 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 people come over to Hollywood to see the stars. They think they're going to run into Marilyn Monroe, and there's <laughs> no, a homeless no, lady it. having a piss. And I've seen it Saturday night. This homeless lady I'm having laughing. A squat. It's kind of sad, though, isn't it? It's totally sad. Yeah. You know, I film a lot of this stuff and post it, right. and it's not not to uh, uh, poke fun at. It's like look at how gross it is on the street. Like this is there's. This so, is a a, a a petri dish of yeah. Anyway, when when did you when did you you know I saw you I don't know just just when everything got shut down here it must have been what uh, when did you arrive back in I got Hamilton? here May first right so you know you've seen the uh, the tent city comparison what, what's the Hamilton comparison oh to not LA? even close right. dude that 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 that's that's. that's that's at every bus stop. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You're right to go gross because it's way worse than that. Right. You, we're talking uh, areas like D level squats so it's almost that like, are as big as this neighborhood. So it's like Armageddon. Oh, totally Armageddon. Right. It looks like it, it is just shy of cannibalism. So do you think that's the difference between Canada and the U.S.? Yeah, we have very much, a, you know, we traded military for health standards. Yeah. That's it, really. Right. There wasn't enough people to protect what we had anyway. Right. It's, you know, what, three quarters the size of Russia with a third of the population. These are my thoughts. You know, I think Canada has a population of you know, roughly close to 40 million. The States is over 300 million. I think it's got to do with the weather, right? Oh, sure. Right? So sure. We know that, look at. You know, minus 30 can really change you. 70,000 people can't live in a tent in no. a city in, in no. Canada. No. It's just, it's well, that's, they have the same issue up at uh, Vancouver. You know, the climate is light enough that they'll, at the least, they'll drown in rain. But these people yeah. are almost like living like they're in the 19th century almost, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. They're, they're just shy of catapults right. and horseback. You know, if someone dropped off a bunch of ponies and some medieval crossbows and shit, right. they would go right to it like fish for water. It's it's a very, uh, what is it, like a caveman, like a Neanderthal. There's modern day technology. Some guy, his feet are bleeding out of his shoes and he's on his iPhone. Right. You know what I mean? This is the, the, the Hollywood mansion and the guy with... Uh, sores on his feet that are seeping, but he's got a state-of-the-art technology in his hand, yet he can't help himself. Right. So, you know, obviously, uh, it's a huge problem, right? What do you think the solution to that problem would be? It's, Being Canadian, right? Oh, dude. They, look at their... They're, they're, I hear, like, a lot of people like are moving out of California to Texas or whatever because, oh, yeah. of, because of this. I'm moving to Texas. I'm right. in Austin. You and Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan, <laughs> Elon Musk. There's about a half a dozen other. Joe made some offers to some of his friends right. to, to move to uh, to move to Texas with him. Right. Some of them accepted. Some of them declined. Right. Um, and uh, it's uh, you know that Sam Kinison joke. Move to where the food is. Right. You know, I never really. I didn't want to get it. I came to Hollywood to kind of hit it like how Tom Green had approached his craft right. to fuck it up. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Tom Green broke television. Yeah, he did. He fucked television. Great guy. Talented guy. Funny guy. Broke. This is what Canadians do. Oh, they're so nice. And then we put pee in your... We take a shit in the cat box. <laughs> and, and we all have a laugh about it. Yeah. So... Um, I'm glad that uh, it, it, I was getting tired, actually, emotionally and financially. 
to, to be able to spend as much downtime as I had there just spitefully. Right. You, you know what I mean? Like, I had no interest of uh, gaining any of the accolades that they had. I'd gotten some HBO stuff and, and things that appealed to an American resume. But I already had successes in, in half a dozen other countries and been around the boat enough to know that my name on the wall of a comedy club wasn't really going to define my place. Right. Because I knew, look, Red Fox, Richard Pryor, like, who are these other guys? These guys are all icons. It's clearly, there's something disappearing. Who was your, who was your favorite comedians when you were growing up? When I was growing up, you know... Everyone's saying Bill Cosby in their head right now for a bunch of terrible reasons. I never liked Bill Cosby. You know, I didn't find him funny. No, but I, I enjoyed a good story. I, did, I didn't mind um, the cartoon. Yeah, Fat Albert. Yeah, that was good. Great. I was younger Great. as a kid. I, I loved it. Yeah, Great. I, I liked cartoons when I was a kid. Totally. You know, we the were Flintstones definitely... Flintstones and you know, Scooby-Doo. And there used to be <laughs> some fucking hamster cage at Eastgate Square. The parents would drop their kids off. It was all carpeted. And it was in a circular uh, thing in the middle of the mall. And it had TVs that played the same Spider-Man. Yeah. Only Spider-Man or something. And kids were eating popcorn off the ground, scratching their assholes, touching the fucking handle. It was a Petri dish where you could just leave your kids. Some parents wouldn't come back. They'd have to sign a form (laughs) and have a secondary contact number because they had problems. They didn't shut it down because parents were abandoning their kids at the Spider-Man booth. (laughs) That 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 was uh, when I lived over by uh, Centennial there. Yeah, I lived in Stony Creek for a while. I was like the only kid uh, on Highway Eight and Margaret Avenue by Millen there. So we're we're not separated too much by age. Like when I was growing up, you know, I, Did I you go to OP. What's that? Did you go to Orchard Park? No, I grew up in Mississauga. Uh, I came from Montreal when I was about uh, ten, eleven, and then I uh, I grew up in Mississauga. Yeah, that came terrible. to Hamilton. From Montreal <laughs> to Mississauga. What was your family on the run? I, I was depressed. That, like, Montreal is one of my favorite yeah, cities. Yeah, we were actually in the world. kind of on the run, right? Because of Bill 22, right? The, the English speaking ah. Quebecers were kind of forced out, right? Well, a lot of people don't listen to this because they don't pay, pay attention to Canadian politics in general. Well, but the history. People don't English pay attention speaking, to history, right? Yeah, English speaking Canadians. Today. Yeah, well, there's because they've got YouTube. Trying to erase it. YouTube. Yeah. yeah. People use, you know, I met, uh, there's this kid that was doing comedy in, in Hamilton and uh, he got the Coles notes of my childhood through YouTube. Right. He goes, I know all these little reference points because you're only talking about the popular ones and those are the ones that gain popularity on the internet. So by process of selection, he's a, more than most times, he knows what I'm talking about that was 20 years his senior. Right. It's really weird. What a weird uh, gyroscope of uh, information that everyone is thrown at them right now. Yeah. Like, I know that you have very... You've been paying attention. Oh, yeah. You've been paying attention. I have to. You, you do. I can't. Right. I'm into the chaos. Right. Okay. You. Hey, well, I watched the show. It's a pretty good show, right? Mm. But I, I remember when I was growing up... Um, it was pretty simple back then. You know, there wasn't a lot of entertainment. We had to entertain ourselves like with street hockey or whatever. Sure. But comedy was huge when I was in high school. Like I, I, I'll never forget Cheech and Chong. Yeah. Cheech and Chong, you know, anything they said that came out of their mouth, we were laughing. Right? Yeah. And once again... It was ridiculous. It was, Americans, know. Tommy Chong is Canadian, which <laughs> I love telling yeah. them. They're like, what? Because all the Latino comics love Cheech and Chong. Don't you think Canadians have bigger imaginations because there's less to do in Canada? Yeah. We have to be creative. Right. Because you oh. literally, as a kid... Two, two, three months of the year, you're on lockdown. There's no going no. outside. You could die. Right. You could die. Put your park on and go play street hockey or get in the house. And don't lose sight of your sibling because if they go down in a drift. And there was, no, find there was no cable television. No. There was no oh. YouTube. Oh, here comes a pony, everybody. <laughs> Me and your grandfather didn't have onions when we were kids. But no, yes. It's definitely... That's funny. This is... Oh, look at... This is just perspective. That's all. I don't look at it as like two old fucks on a week <laughs> trying to avoid a responsibility. Right. But, but, um... But who is... Who 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 were you into comedy-wise, Mike? 
you know. So when you were in high school, who, you know, you obviously know, you're a comedian. I, you, I love Carlin. Right. I love guys that were like. Well, he's more of a, he's even like a philosopher comedian. Yeah. Though, right? I love, I love people that were good at things that I wasn't, you know, right. like Bill Hicks, you know, even Richard Pryor and, and, uh, people that had long form stories, but with those really solid. So I was too impatient because I grew up in a traumatic environment that you it had. To, look, in Hamilton, you either had to be, it was fight or flight. Right. And if you were going to fuck with somebody, it better make the whole group laugh. Yeah. Or you were <laughs> on a fucking guillotine and, and, and possibly fuck up your whole year. Yeah. So, um, I understand when that I see, when yeah. I hear somebody go, oh, they're so relaxed. Oh, yeah. How do they get away with talking that long with no one throwing a bottle at them? I couldn't <laughs> believe it, you know. But, um, again, like... Well, Richard Pryor Steve and uh, Eddie Murphy, they, they, yeah, they, Eddie Murphy, they, they could throw the F-bomb like nobody's business, right? Yeah. They really knew how to use that word. Yeah. And they, they got a lot of laughs out of using the word fuck, right? It was so ingrained in what they were doing. It wasn't out of character. No. And uh, there a lot of people that will frown upon language, like Eddie Murphy had a call from Bill Cosby, a very famous I bet story. He did. Bill Cosby called and chewed him out. Said he was filthy, should be ashamed of himself, needs to clean it up. This oh, is embarrassing Bill for Bill Crosby. Us. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> On the judgment throne, eh, Bill? It's <laughs> always that way. I'm the most vilest terrible person on I've stage, seen, I've, right? I've seen you, your act. You've tried to cut, cut through a crowd. Up. Yes, yeah. pretty much. So mm. the clean acts, look, Dave Attell, one of, one of the greatest, filthiest, uh, surgeon, uh, one of the most polite, pleasant, friendly people, you know, as much as Dave Attell could be. Um, but some of the, the so-called nice comics are usually the the, uh, the friendly, upbeat guys. They become the Jared from Subway, right. you know, very quickly. I'm always suspect of these guys. I'm like, in my head, I meet these high-profile uh, darlings, and I'm like, this guy's a fucking... Nah, 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 nah. Does <laughs> yeah. anyone else get in this? Yeah. I'm like, but they're so... Boy, this guy's great. Have you met Jerry... No one, this guy's a fucking got baby skins on hooks in his basement. You're yeah. talking to John Wayne Gacy. Anyway, I won't kill anybody, I no. promise. So, yes, the long form storytellers, I, I love to be uh, uh, interested enough in what somebody was talking about to hear it for more than a page. So. Right. But then, uh, you know, outrageous stuff. Andy Kaufman, just the fuckery alone. Yeah. Like, legendary. Yeah, iconic. He, he, can, like, he can turn into a stage character. You know, uh, Steve Martin. And not come out of character. Multiple. You didn't even know where the beginning of that guy's no, life. He, and not to mention, he brings in Bob Mazuda to also play. <clears throat> I met him. Right. I was Unfortunately, I never met any Kaufman, but I was lucky enough to be at the improv one night when, when Bob was there discussing what his process was, what he'd had to do for George Shapiro and Andy and him have to come in and out of the room with makeup on and until George couldn't figure out who was who, right. then they would go on with it. But until they had that thing that they had, um, he couldn't determine who was playing, um, what's his name, the fucking drunk guy with the hookers. I saw, oh, him flick, I, I saw him flick a fucking cigarette butt right in a guy's face. Yeah, the, 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 the base. Uh, Tony Clifton. Tony Clifton. Yeah, yeah. So the Tony Clifton. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so Andy and Bob would come into George Shapiro's office in the same makeup and do the same. And he, until they got it seamless, would, would make them do it. But yeah, he, he did a week at the comedy store. And every night he'd come out smoking a cigarette. And fucking flick it right in this guy's fucking face, and then start the band. The hookers would come out. It was it was amazing. <laughs> well, you know the, the funny thing about you know me, me being in the industry, the entertainment industry. When I was younger, all I did was go to Yuck Yucks a lot. Yeah, it That's, was it was something to do because again, there wasn't a lot. You know, not to say that you know uh, I'm an old relic, but back in the in the late seventies, there, there wasn't much to do. No, and, and Yuck Yucks was a big part. Uh, yeah, you were going to a play. This was a bar where the comedian's going to tell some dirty jokes. Right, and Second City had improv. Yeah. You know, it, it was funny stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, comedy was a big part of my life this when I was like a kid. This is Yeah. Yeah. Second City, you know, SCTV's huge. Yeah. You know, this is even bigger than Kids in the Hall. And probably more respected <clears throat> as far as, you know, look, not to mention, 
uh, my friend was bragging to me about uh, Eugene Levy just got like swept the Emmys. Yes. Like six Emmys Saw or something that, yeah. for up Slits Creek. Slits Creek. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and he swept the Emmys. Have you seen that show? I have not. I haven't either. I haven't. Everybody uh, always brings up these Canadian shows to right. me and hockey games that I've never seen any of it. Uh, you know, my cutoff for Canadian comedy, like, you know, it was it was kind of kids in the hall. Right. You know, that, that was my kind of Chappelle show at that time. The kids in the hall in the 80s was like the most punk rock shit. Yeah. 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 It, it had... And it had no hang-ups or... Bound- it was just, They were doing some very, very pioneering uh, sketch comedy. Fortunately, Norm Michaels was smart enough to see that and, and actually take it. So. so did you grow up always wanting to be a comedian? No. So you just you you fell ser- into it? Serial or? killer. No, I just ran out of... Or a serial killer. Yeah, yeah it, was, it was considering <laughs> that. It's just, <laughs> oh, man. Look, you know, I always loved comedy. Always loved music. Right. You know, um, I didn't know anybody that did it, either of it, really. There was any bands. So, to me, you know, there was nothing like a smoky bar, man, right? Totally love it. Right? Yeah, with booze. That's what yeah. I tell the audience. I go, listen, have some shots. You know, yeah. this would be way better if you guys were yeah, just a little sloppy. A little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get, have get, a bit of social yeah. lubricant. Yeah, right? you've seen movies with people having a good time. We yeah. can do that again. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. And then the, you see some people go... Oh, okay, yeah. Oh, yeah, you know what? Let's get a little fucked up tonight. The, the guys I found the best were the MCs I could fart around with the audience. Yeah. Like, you know, heckle the audience. Well, that was like the highlight of the whole show, right? That's how I think Mike who, who, Bullard... Who, who, who was the best? Mike Bullard was... Mike Bullard was the most well-known person. I think actually that his skill with the audience allowed him to get a talk show out of it. Right. Uh, but he, I've seen you do you're, you're pretty good. I had to, you know, we were talking about long form storyteller comedians. Right. Well, I, I cut it down to every line had to be funny. Right. And coming up through doing combative, like after hours clubs in uh, Vancouver, where I moved to start stand up, uh, and then doing shady spots here just for bands and stuff. You, half the people were standing. Right. Fucked out of their heads. And they're like, who's this asshole? And what instruments does he play? And they're like, it's 3 a.m. and there's a comedian on? Fuck you, you know? And then it was, we were off. You know, I had, right. to, I had to fucking club all the seals. Everybody had to get shot between the eyes. Right. And then they'd go, okay, yeah, all right, all right. Everyone shut up. This guy's out of control. Yeah. Let, let, it, let it ride. This, this, is, this is, okay, we're okay. But yeah, they'll test you more. You know, as a person that loves comedy, yeah. you know, I at least love that. Yeah, I love it. This the person that put himself out there and made some stupid comment or a heckler, like oh, oh dice, what, dude, what are you dice? Doing? I've seen him, especially people. You know, when I first moved to LA, I think maybe around five or six years after I moved there, he started popping around. And they go, dice was here, and I was like, fuck, I missed him again. And I got to see him in the small room that faces the patio, talk about fucking fat chicks for forty minutes. Girls are Chickery yelling at him. Dock. The chick was a- <laughs> one of his iconic, <laughs> yeah. you know, legendary bits. But he's talking about this fat chick's pussy for forty minutes. <laughs> chicks, chicks are yelling at him. Like he recorded an album there with Rick Rubin, and now these people, because people were heckling him on that double album that he did with Rick yeah. Rubin. So now I'm like, everyone's in the know. The comics are crying because some girl's losing her shit, and it's like thirty years later. And there's another woman in the same club having a hissy fit, and oh, everyone's no. laughing at her. Yeah, oh, I love it. Bro, listen, Brian Holtzman, I, you, you'll probably never see him. And um, unfortunately, the, fortunately, the, he's got his own... Actually, I'm going to give Brian Holtzman... He's got a podcast called Dead Air. Brian Holtzman is like... Think of Jackie Gleason with zero likability and a little bad lieutenant. So he's, it's got a, awesome. he's got a sidekick? It's, it, no, no, no. He, he embodies this. Oh, I see. He's, dude, this guy, I've never seen a people clear out an audio, a room that holds 400 people with 30 people in it at yeah. the end of the night down to one person at the right. end of the night. It is the most explosive. Uh, it's pure glass. It's just broken glass rubbed into your ears. And the people that embrace this, 
when they see people like they do at my show, you know, somebody stands up and they're like, oh, this is going to be great. Oh, no. Oh, no. This, <laughs> there oh, we this go. Is, this is what we're, we're about to get our money's worth. And that's what happened. Brian, someone would go, fuck you. You don't know who I am. Fuck you, you cocks. You know, and it, it's, it becomes a, uh, he gets the same Kinison spot every, every night. Every night. I think he gets a Kinison spot every night uh, at the comedy store up until this COVID and I'd be exhausted because I'd be sitting at the patio at the store, you know, 10 o'clock. He doesn't go on till like 1.30. And I'd be doing, you know, Cirque du Soleil with a bunch of weirdos on the Sunset Boulevard. And now this madman, this, this disgruntled dog catcher with a claw <laughs> hammer. And uh, to see people stick their heads under the blade. Oh, uh, yeah. I, I'm with you on that. I enjoy a good... Uh, public execution. They are uh, great you know for the ego check. Nothing. Some girl, you don't know. <laughs> oh, so yeah. some girl, aren't you going to say something? The guy's like, oh, fuck. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. I'm... You know, yeah, there's nothing that lights up the spirit more than laughter, right? Yeah. No, I think it cures cancer. Well, I, I think it I think it does. A, it cures a lot of things, right? Totally, totally. I think it, as far as essential uh, services, you know... Seeing comedy is is probably a uh, a lot beneficial than some of the pharmaceuticals that they're offering now. And I'm, I'm trying not to be judgmental here, but what I see is our young people. You know, they're not they're not too much into laughter. Like no, know, they're a little more sensitive well, because and, they're 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 looking through a, their keyholes different, and it's right. the cell phone. You know, a lot of the information they get, you're you're not getting the physical. That's why I said the audience. I go, I have to remind them, have a drink. Right. And they're like, oh, yeah, that's right. We come to bars. Well, and we came out. here to have fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I forgot. And because, Hang on. Let me check my phone. <laughs> exactly. Let me see if it's okay if I can have fun now. I want to tape the phones facing the wall all, so they can see where they are. Well, I'm like a Blue Jay fan. And they'll look at I, me. I, I, love, I love the Blue Jays. I go watch the Blue Jays. Every Everybody's got their phone. Yeah. I'm, I'm sitting there going, yeah. I'm going, let's go, right? Like, There's a great... You don't uh, want to miss it. You don't want to miss the moment. Judas Priest. Rob Halford's doing a show. It's a great video. Guy's got his phone up and, and fucking that old leather fag <laughs> gives his fucking phone a boot. It could have it zipped out of this kid's hand. And I'm like, fuck yeah. I'm sick of it. You know, the phones. I've, but people are trying to capture something so they can exploit you with it later. Most of the people are hoping they're going to stumble into some sort of successes by a, a freak out that I might have. <laughs> Were you ever uh, on the university circuit? Yeah, I got Campus Comedian of the Year. Has that dried up for you guys? Oh, um, that dried up 20 years and ago. And what, what is the reason for that? Because of me. Because of you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's because of me. You were that offensive. That was about, oh, yeah. But I never called and some girl shoved a beer bottle up my asshole oh, no. and then made out with me. Isn't that weird? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't think it'd go in that easy. But I think I was leaning too far into it. So it dried up 20 years ago. Oh, yeah. Because what happens is, is uh, the Americans have this uh, college uh, university circuit. Super lucrative. You know, guys are making hundreds of thousands of dollars right. a year just doing colleges. And, and, and that's what I heard. NACA. Oh, this, this university circuit. Well, they've got something in Canada. If I can make a third of that money, right. I've got a decent career in, in yeah. Canada. So... I was like, great, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get me into these colleges. I'm at the right age. You know, I've got some, some things that are at least on television that they could put on a poster and start doing these college gigs. Well, around nine, I went Campus Comedian of the Year in 98. And literally by 99, by 2000, things started to kind of go, Jason, we can't have you. This year, I went from, you know, doing these schools every year, sometimes twice a year, being a kind of a, a college comedy darling. Right. To, you can't come around here no more, so no. You got to go. You're too hot. We can't have, we don't want to have to explain about our fucking comedy show. We got tons of sponsors. These schools are financed. They're not, you're not going to look good in the paper. Right. So then I was like, okay, well, I've been cut out of that. I had a good run. I got a trophy. But then I started to notice 2001. I did my Comedy Now special in 2000. I gave him a, a script, page script. I knew that I'd been subjected to 
being cut out of things because there was a lot of gray area about what I was going to do that night. So I made sure that I had a word for word script of everything that I was going to be. Gave them that months before. I know they didn't read it. Maybe they did. Tape the first show. Mark Breslin comes up to me and goes, they want to talk to you. <laughs> what? About what? I did exactly what I said I was going to do. What are we talking about? I don't need a freak out before I do my second taping. Because my first one was mediocre. But I want, I want the big one. And now there's all the executives are sitting there. And I'm like, Dude, there's no money on the table. There's not a millionaire in the fucking room. And we're going to have a discussion about my material. It was a bag joke, a joke that I had written in a five-minute set when I first started comedy. I'm like, that's it? They wanted to know that they had a crowbar under what I was doing so that if there was any... Censorship. Censorship to it. They didn't know where to start, so they put the shit bag joke because it was a testicular thing that they could put a ribbon on it and go, we can't do this one. I go, I'm sucking my dad's dick in one of my jokes. Yeah, you don't want to hear that one yet. Anyway... But yes. So what's the difference uh, between today's comedy and, let's say, th- 20, 30 years ago? Is there a difference? Oh, the, the is there, illusion... Is there, is there, is there, the audience still there? There's teams now. There's teams. This is comedy. is a team sport. Right. And I'm not a Jersey guy. I've never been... No, you I, don't strike me as a I'm, Jersey guy. I'm not a Jersey guy. So um, these, these because of the internet and social climate and, and all these other elements that have forced people... In they finding these these fucking codependent tribal uh, cliques, and they're so called comedians, and they become these social justice people that, with no perspective or life experiences, commenting on what other comedians are doing. So it's 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 the snake eating its tail. They're not even funny. Let's get you, they're, te- they're terrible. I, I I feel gross in the sense calling them comedians because. That is such a thing that's been smeared all over the place. And uh, it, most of them are out-of-work actors with blank protest signs. Right. Or somebody, uh, some fucking, uh, 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 <clears throat> what do you call it, uh, pageant queen with an agenda. You know what I mean? And everyone thinks she's cute. She's a massive following on Instagram. So she gets a lot of traction very quickly on these little kind of taunted uh, self, whatever. She's probably gross. So do you think? Are, do you think the young, talented comedians, you know, that you know, or classic comedians, are getting you know discouraged because the market's changed? Well, that's the thing, though. It, there's you are the market. You know what I mean? You build it, and they'll come, kind of thing. So the market's always changing. Now it doesn't exist anymore. The playing field is kind of leveled out. So the DIY business model approach to comedy which is something I was have had in place for 15 20 years now uh, is the new business model so fuck I lost my train of thought <laughs> <laughs> I was like oh there's a fireplace <laughs> uh, yeah it's changed no our, our young comedians getting discouraged is what we're talking about yeah but good if, if you're getting discouraged then quit right you know what I mean it's like quit if you're, if you're having angst at this level yeah. And there's no no real nothing. You're not uh, uh, wagering anything. Right. You're just struggling with the lack of stage time or the politics of your scene or uh, maybe with the, uh, the the lack of time or whatever. But um, so the talent is still out there. There's always talent. Right. There's, it's pressure and diamonds, right? Right. You there's people haven't been they've been living in this decadence for so long that there's been no. Uh, uh, famines and, and, and these, these wars right. that we've, we've been isolated from have now be, made us all fat in the head. Right. And um, the ego. The ego is so padded yeah, out, it man. It is the enemy, right? It's padded out, and they bring that ego into my show. Yeah. And I'm trying to do some fucking crazy nonsense. Let go, let go of the ego. Let go of the ego. Yeah, just... Don't bring your picnic basket to my dinner party. Right. You fucking don't, assholes. Don't Let's have a laugh. Don't politicize my And you can yet. use it. You're a miserable twat. <laughs> you need to laugh more than anybody oh, in yeah. this room. You need to lighten up. Not only that, give that guy or that lady, whatever, some mushrooms. <laughs> and we'll start the show in 20 minutes yeah. to wait for you mushrooms to kick in. And you'll have, you're, you're, you're going to have a you. Well, I, I believe that a lot of people 
believe they have to act a certain way. They're not. They, they don't allow themselves to be their true selves. Well, this is the tribal thing, you know. Right. They figure if they act this way, they'll get love from these certain right. groups. Yeah, they're, it's gross. They're, they're looking it's to gross. be part of a tribe. Like, well, I go, I'm not the problem. No. I'm not the problem. You're, you're in the wrong neighborhood. There's real problem out there. Yes. And there's 60 tents on a, on a corner here. And, and what are you doing about that besides commenting on it? Exactly. Right. It's crazy. Are you actually helping with the problem or, I, are, you, or are you just making comments? Me, I go up and I lick their foreheads to <laughs> boost my immune system. I wanna, I'm a little nervous. I believe that. I, I, I nibble, I go sneak under their sleeping bags and nibble on their toenails oh, that no. look like Cool Ranch Doritos. Yeah. If they you were know, I, I have a lot of interactions with the homeless in Hamilton, right? Well, you have to. Well, you know, they come up to you and, you know, I, I ask most of them if they're okay. Yeah. They're, all they're looking for is some sort of connection. Yeah. A human connection. I'm a human being just like you are, you know, and, and I will spend time with them, right? No, I'll see a, like a, a poor guy or a woman that has schizophrenia and they're talking to themselves and then all of a sudden you, you engage them, boom, they stop talking to themselves. Totally. They're so detached. Look at I've spent, you know, especially in these isolated uh, situations that we've been in for long periods of time, you know, some people are more quick to lose their marbles in, in an isolated situation and just being separated from society right. for long periods of time. And... Uh, it's embarrassing to Canada to see all this. Yes. You know, I see it's, it's Los Angeles is another place altogether, but the amount of that I've seen up behind, um, the Ontario center yeah. in the back there, I don't know what the attraction is in certain areas of the city. There's large blocks. Not well, to I mention, think, I think they put, um, some out, uh, what do you call those porta porta potties? They right? did. And I think that's all right. This is where they want us. This is where we'll camp. Out. They're gone. They, not, but, they, they, but they never left, right? They were guys in hazmat suits washing these things. Right. So I don't know what... Like, they've got full-on... Guys have living room sets yeah. on the corner, man. It's, it no, is, I've seen it. They, and some of them are quite neat, right? It's like... No, no, no. <laughs> look at... Some of these guys are trying to, like, look at... Find some stability in their life. And a street corner with a table and a couch. There's one at Hunter and I think it's James Street. Yeah. It's like a, a, no. a one-man living quarter. Yeah, there's there's some guys that clearly have and it's some, all neat with a bench and you know yeah no it's civilized yeah there's there's some uh, uh, class to that you know the guys you know there's worms all over them well it's kind of like 19th century gypsy life yeah. right yeah or uh, Hastings Street in Vancouver is another I've never been there you have never been to Vancouver I've been to Vancouver but I've never been to Hastings Vancouver is beautiful it feels yeah. like you're in a foreign country <laughs> yeah yeah it doesn't yeah, feel yeah. like Canada good sushi. Good sushi? Good sushi. Yeah. Toronto's got good sushi. Hamilton's got good sushi. Hamilton's got yeah, good man. sushi? Yeah, man. is awesome. Have you been is there? it? Oh, it's awesome. Where's I Sapporo's? love sashimi. It's at the corner of uh, John and Main Street. That place? Right across from the courthouse. Is good? It's awesome. Really? There's so many places I've, I've revisited. Sashimi there is great. I, okay. I love sashimi. So yeah, I love a good sashimi. Yeah, they have good sashimi there. It's, it's hit and miss. I have friends that uh, go to all-you-can-eat sushi... And uh, they're like world class eaters. They'll eat like 120 pieces of sushi. Right. And then, uh, but what the asshole does too is he balls up a lot of the rice and puts it in my jacket pockets for me to find on the bus. Right, nice. Yeah, yeah. You think that's funny? Yeah, I do. Yeah. <laughs> he also, Good for him. You know what he does too is he <laughs> takes his buddy's cars and throws garbage bags in the back of his car overnight. So when they come home with their car, it smells like trash. That's <laughs> right? a good one. Isn't that great? Yeah, well, do you get them back or just let, let them get away with Are them? you the practical joker in your family? Uh, me? Are you just the guy that goes, wow, that is terrible. That's hilarious. Uh, I'm not much of a practical joker, but I see the humor in a lot of things, right? Okay, yeah. You definitely have to gain a, uh, just a simple walk around the neighborhood. What's happening? Speaking of the neighborhood, you've been running a business here in Hamilton. Can we hit pause? i got to go to the bathroom. Yeah, go to the bathroom. <laughs> Just because now it's all I'm starting to think. Oh, I got to tell you, though, these bubbly, sparkling like the waters. Is, is, do you have something, a hand in this? Is this something to do? No, is man. this local? No, it's what I drink, right? You said bubbly like three times. You just like saying bubbly? <laughs> no, I just like the name of it. I like you the love it. Look at how happy you are. Yeah, man. This is equivalent Gino. Do you like it? 
I, I enjoy it, but I also uh, my buddy uses the uh, the squirt in kind of flavored things without the carbonation. Yeah, I, it's carbonation. It's I'm uh, all about the no sugar, right? I, mm. I try not. To, I try to stay away from sugar. So. Yeah, sugar is. Um, yeah, I'll go and eat like six butter tarts yeah. off the uh, that twenty four hour store on the corner. Right. Um, I've uh, I've eaten some. Interesting things. I bet you yeah. have. A homeless girl in Slovenia was probably the worst thing. <laughs> With coleslaw. I couldn't even. I'm like, I've turned into my father. <laughs> but you, you've never, you've left the city. Oh, yeah. You've been on vacation. Of course. Where is it? Like Mexico, like every other Canadian? No, I've been, uh, I like the Caribbean. Yeah. Yeah. How long is that flight? Well, it depends on what part of the Caribbean, right? Southern Caribbean, five hours. St. Martin's a nice place. A lot of friends going to Barbados. I've been to, I've been to uh, you like tropical island. Yeah, kind of I, I like the ocean. Seasons, you know, yeah. There's nothing like the, the the Pacific Coast in Mexico. You know, something really spiritual about you know, the Pacific Ocean. Like, well, you lived in California. There's something yeah. about the Pacific. South like, Africa. Right, the Atlantic. Uh, 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 <laughs> that's, Cape, that's the Cape Atlantic Town. Ocean, right? Yeah, I, I had like a kind of like. Wow. Yeah. This is crazy. Yeah. Look at this. I am nothing. Right. <laughs> I'm dog shit on the beach. Yeah, yeah, this is like, they've been doing this forever. Yeah. So, and, uh, you know, I'm sitting here like a jackass with a, a, some calamari and a cafe latte watching the sun yeah. go down in this beautiful, just cradle of life. It's humbling. Yeah. Know? I've spent, great. spent a lot of time in southern Florida. My mother lives there. I love Florida. It's a retiree, isn't it? Oh, it's God's waiting room, right? Isn't it? Because <laughs> of the fentanyl, though, right? Oh, yeah. They got a big the pill problem. And yeah. And the retirees, yeah. What a weird... You put people with weak hearts and jet fuel <laughs> in the same yeah. city. Yeah, no, I, I plan on going to Miami just for Cuban food alone. I heard it's Miami, outstanding. I, I, love, I love Miami. Have you Good been to food? Miami? No. That's a great place. No, I'm I'm looking forward... It's an international place. I'm stuck. Not stuck. I'm going to be in the States for six months and I plan on visiting, you know, more than Los Angeles and Texas. I'd like to get a trip into New York, but... People from all over the world go to Miami. Yeah. Really nice classical hotels. It's, it's a beautiful spot. I, I, I've been going there once a year for the last five or six years. Yeah. And Cuban food, delicious. Do you mess with uh, it? Uh, no, I've not. You know the, the cuisine and spaghetti and meatballs in Miami. <laughs> cuisine in Miami is Americano, man. It's just yeah. like uh, if you want to go into the local areas, then you're taking your life in your own hands, right? Like, ah, okay. Yeah, South Africa. The states. There's a yeah. bit of a separation between. Yeah. You, the certain areas you don't go to. Not only areas, block to block. Right. Like I never realized it was that. Kind of structure, right? Yeah, you can make the wrong a, turn. Yeah, you literally. I always thought about that you know, when I was in Mexico. You mm -hmm. make the wrong turn in Mexico, you're in the wrong spot, right? But yeah, there's a lot of spots like that. In the they US. like to say they're melting pot. They're very segregated. Canada, we don't have a lot of now. You, know, you can't make a lot of wrong turns in Canada. No, Unless Barton and Sanford. Uh, you end up starting a family in Winnipeg. Midnight. <laughs> no, not to mention if you get. Can you imagine? Like, some people have grown up in very hard environments going out to, like, the Maritimes for the first time, yeah. you know, and just being like, what? They, we don't know, understand the fucking word they're saying, but they're so nice. <laughs> oh, I know, I've been to this guy's it? house for dinner six times. I don't even know his name. The Maritimes is a totally different... Yeah. It's a, it's, it's, I've been to PEI. I've been to uh, New Brunswick. You know, Fantastic. Yeah, I love it there. Yeah, it's it's a good time, and uh, I, it's my uh, obligation to tourism Canada. <laughs> right. Go and see the country. Yes. Fuck Winnipeg. <laughs> right. my, my dad says Winnipeg is the coldest city in the world. Yeah, I yeah. believe it. Have you been there in the wintertime? No, but I've been to Thunder Bay in February, and that oh. was minus 40. Yeah. And, uh, it's a different kind of animal. No, no, there's no there's no going outside. You can be dead in 10 minutes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, this is us Canadians. We know winter's quickly approaching, so right. we, we're starting to show our anxieties. A little bit. Um I'm in Oshawa. The days are already shorter, right? I'm. Uh, is it shorter? Days Did we shorter. roll back? No, but they're shorter. You can tell. Like it's it's uh. dark by seven o'clock now. All right, because we I'm haven't even rolled back yet. What? You, what is it? Uh, no, we already did that, didn't we? We don't roll we back. Go, we no? roll back end of October. It's usually around Halloween. That's right. What are you doing for Halloween? This place is going to be hopping with. Oh pussy. yeah, with, with fifty capacity per side. Fifty. <laughs> that's We're only allowed to have fifty people. That's a again. That's. Exactly what I'm doing. I'm in the same business, but I'm on the other side of the right. bar. You know, I'm a, uh, uh, 
How are I'm, the comedy clubs doing right now? It's 50 people. You know, they, they so seem to be sub- the subjected. My shows are. Yeah, but are you it, charging more? Or? No. No, no, no. There's no money. Right. There was never money. Right. That's the thing, <laughs> right? It was like, oh, I'm going to go to a great college. And I might get some bonuses off right. the back of it, you know. I look at the math of it. What do you got? Say 20 clubs, 500 headliners. Yeah. 5,000 comedians. Yeah. And the college circuit, the corporate circuit, and the club circuit. All right, there's 900 guys out of work. Right. So, and now you're squabbling over the other, whatever, grand nickel and dime. I'm like, I tell these guys, they're like, oh, God. And I'm like, this is no money. I know. How do you like this format? Podcasting? Yeah. I do because uh, I like to engage them one on one. I like performing. Well, you're, in a, lot you're, of you're a great conversationalist. You really well, like, I just and smoked and a yeah, huge cannon you know, yeah, to loosen that. up. And you have even you know you know your history. People are you know people people are interested in history. Yeah, right. Because that's how we learn. Our experience is our biggest asset, and that's we only learn from our experience. I, I don't want to hear about somebody's opinion. I want to hear about your experience. That's why I've asked you questions. Sure. Right? Because I'm, I'm a huge comedy fan. Yeah. I always have been. And and. Vice versa, I love going out to nightclubs right. and getting fucking trash. Yes. Or used to. Right. I had a lot of fun. I blogged in a lot of hours. Right. Uh, between your handful of uh, ventures. Right. What is, so, Stars, Energy, Kingdom, Fever, Fever Funky Koi, Monkey, Funky Monkey Diablo, Koi, Diablo Sizzle, Coggle, Curly Koi Sizzles, Sizzle, yeah. Koi Sizzle. Okay, yeah. So we had some clubs in Oshawa. Ten nightclubs over 30 years. Yeah, more than that. That's pretty you good. Remember the ballroom yeah. and the yeah. syndicate? Yeah, those were ours. Too. Yeah. How do you... <laughs> how, how do you not... What is the... Like... Look, you've been babysitting idiots for 30 years. Yeah. Do you know that? Oh, yeah. I understand that. Like, yeah. this is a, a very rare... You're, you're, you're like the, the Tiger King of Hamilton. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I haven't seen that show. No, is that an insult? No, it's terrible. <laughs> terrible. He's, a, he's a gay meth addict who uses these poor tigers. That's me. To do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I remember you had those cougars for yeah. a week, but I thought they were attacking you on the Bruce Trail there. That's funny. See, I know the truth, right? That doesn't offend me. Right? No. You know, when you know the truth, you can't be offended, right? That's why when people stand up at the show and protest, I'm like, that person's in trouble. Yeah. That's a bad... That, right. There, there, there's something under that. Let's pull back your curtain. Right. Jummy. Yeah. Yeah. What are you, what are you hiding? Yeah, what are you hiding? Right. So uh, I love getting uh, pedophiles angry at me. Yeah. <laughs> they get really angry. Yeah. So if you're angry well, at your my story, show... Your story about Bill Cosby giving... Uh, Eddie Murphy. Eddie's shit, right? Mm-hmm. You know, like, where are you coming R- from, Bill? Richard Pryor told him to tell Bill to shut the fuck up right. and have a Coke. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so we're back at Bill Cosby again. You keep bringing him up. I'm going to get canceled. Yeah. Bill Cosby. <laughs> That's the goal. That's it, right? <laughs> uh, I should probably hit record now. <laughs> uh, I should announce some shows. I'm actually performing here in Hamilton. Nice. Probably the first time in about four years to 50 when? people. Uh, October 1st, two shows. I think they're sold out. They're sold out. Uh, but we might add a show uh, next week in the middle of the week. I think Tuesday or, or, or Wednesday. Tuesday, I think. And um, Toronto, Edmonton, Calgary. Um, geez. And then back in L.A. for a bit. And then I'll be doing some shows, I guess, in Texas at some point. Nice. But um, check out my movie. It's on uh, the trailers on YouTube. It's called Spare Parts. There's going to be some sort of premiere in April. So I, if you're in Toronto at that time... Please come out, and uh, if you're drinking and driving, make sure that gun's not loaded under a seat. It's bumpy out there. Yeah. Thanks for being on the show. Oh, thanks for and having me. And do you have anything to plug? Do you got like do you, do you do social media? Yeah, we yeah. Uh, uh, we're on Instagram, uh-huh. Sizzle and Koi. Uh, we're also on Facebook. Yeah. Um, you know, we're, events we're, coming we're, up. Currently, we're, we're open. You know, unex, you know, surprisingly, we're, we've been busy. You know, yeah. We're following all the the guidelines from from the local health department, mm-hmm. and yeah, this people is, are people are actually coming and they're having fun. So, yeah, um, we're open uh, seven days a week. Um, we're open late, mm-hmm. so you know if you're looking for somewhere to come and hang out late at night, come down open. to Hess Village Hess on a Friday Village. and Saturday. Not to mention, don't believe uh, don't believe all the hype. You know, Hess Village is a 
you know, it's been in Hamilton, you know, for a long time, and it's a very safe place to come. Yeah, people villainize it. I have friends that have been business owners here for forever, and look at it. Never had any problems here. You know, it's the mainstream. They want to isolate it. Mainstream media likes to make a story, right? Of course, right? You know, I've had these conversations. Fake news. (laughs) It's all over the place. Yeah, and I, I. I um I'm 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 gonna spread some more rumors and fake news about <laughs> yeah. everything. And uh thanks for listening everybody and uh happy Halloween. Oh, this is the bonus section. This is a, a part two. Part de. Part de. Yeah, you must uh speak a little French, right? May we say pal do more possibly. Yeah. But um. you, you you were exiled from Yeah, exiled, yes. From in what, like eighty five? No, uh, seventy six. You left in seventy six. No, it's seventy four. Who was running uh, the show over it? Was this a Trudeau? No, the the Parti Québécois. You know, okay, it was the birth of. Uh, were you one of those kids that were like having to fight every day in the neighborhood? We, uh, I had, I learned how yeah. to take care of myself. Yeah, I I didn't know it was that bad, because. Um, uh, you know, some comedians and friends of mine have grown up in there, and uh, I had a problem there with some police. But anyway, um, well, there was the alcohol cue. You know, it was very political. You know, the language. The cop was right in my face when I yeah. would not speak English to me. Right. Like it was insane, and he kept trying to take me to jail. But I was like, <laughs> I did my gig. I go, I don't care. He was angry because I didn't have my ID, and I explained to them that I wouldn't carry my passport on me, but I do have a green card. And he continued to berate me in French while my friend did translation, who's local, who's yeah. Quebec guy, speak perfect well, French. What city were you in? Montreal. Montreal? St. St. Catherine Street on Friday night, 2 a.m. He got my face over a jaywalking. When suspicion. was that? Like six years ago, seven wow. years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's surprising. It was pretty funny because he thought I was by myself and I didn't have access to the language. Right. And my friend comes up, who's a citizen, a local, you know, more or less, who's working now as my lawyer, as this police officer is trying to get me to apologize and threatening me with her incarceration. Right. As I stepped off the sidewalk to come back, I saw the cop, as people were running up and down St. Catherine Street. Yeah. So he's like, go, we'll get you to jail. And I'm like, I'll go, I don't care. I'm done. (laughs) (laughs) And we stood, we had a standoff. For like a half hour, I, he, was he a young guy? No, uh, no, he was about my age, maybe a little younger. But he wanted me to apologize, and I would not apologize. Anyway, it was hilarious. But uh, Martin Streak, right, right. We we're talking about the nightclub era and the voice of that, not only in the nightclubs, but on you know commercial alternative alternative rock radio. Um, Probably the biggest station in the country at that time, with the most popular radio voice in the country at that time, uh, Martin Streak, who uh, was like just a name. I remember seeing him the first time playing pool at the Kingdom. He was always playing pool and um, didn't become friends with him. You know, that club environment was not a really... A place to build long-lasting relationships. <laughs> you know what I mean? A lot mean? of fair-weather friends, right? A lot of fair-weather friends. Right. It, we meet up every weekend. That's what we did. It was like it was like uh, playing on a baseball team yeah. on the weekend. So you go and do this, see who's still alive at the end, and maybe we'll do it next week right. if we can find parking. And it always sucked because your parking lots were always slippery and icy yes. and dangerous. You see chicks. Uh, you try not to laugh because you can hear girls' arms breaking. <laughs> Right? How many girls busted their wrists trying to take a piss in between two cars in front of your nightclub? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> well, let's go to the never video clip. Let's say, I'm going to show the video clip. I never, I never thought of it. I put together a montage of just local Burlington girls horse pissing. Oh, yeah. Kids fighting in dress shoes and slippery weather. But Martin was the, uh, you know, on air personality for, you know, he introduced me to so much music and, and uh, ran uh, a various nights in and around Hamilton and Toronto. But it was like Toronto, Hamilton or for him. Yeah. He'd do his shows at uh, the Phoenix. Right. Uh, which I think was... Did he have the Phoenix on the Thursday and do Kingdom on the Friday? Or was it the other way around? Phoenix was Saturday. Phoenix was Saturday and he... Had, no, Phoenix was Sunday. Wasn't it RPM? Yeah. Was Saturday? 
And Martin would made, made uh, famous by Chris, the puppy dog Shepherd. Chris Shepherd, yeah. What was your experience with him? Because I was uh, in the house music. Uh, Chris Shepherd, he was a character. Did he do a ton of cocaine? Uh, (laughs) Allegedly? Uh, Allegedly. Allegedly. He was a character, right? (laughs) (laughs) He he lived the life of a rock star, I'll put it that way. And and he was a rock star. I remember, you know, I I used to pick him up on Thursdays and take him out to our club in Oshawa. Yes. You know, yeah, he did a lot of We paid him a really pretty penny, and people came to see him. Okay, and, what was... And I remember these global uh, television personalities would come, and they were, like, in awe of this guy. Yeah. These are, like, people that are on TV, I and mean, Chris Shepard was, like... People, yeah. people worship that what guy. Did, what, did, what, what did he get? Like, 50 grand? For, for To work a night as a yeah. DJ? Five grand? Five grand as yeah, a DJ? Yeah, for two hours, and he had somebody else play for Yeah, him. yeah, yeah. I remember that was, like, the thing. He, because he had, he had thing, a, like, a little crate of records, and some guy played for him. And he'd go like this. You, know, you can't see me, but he'd be... Uh, yeah. Everybody go, ah. Yeah. And then he got involved in the rave scene, the rave scene in the late 90s. Yeah, and he, then he opened, And then he started a, uh, a group called BKS. Mm-hmm. And that's where Martin came in, right? And when Chris left, uh, CFNY, Marty came in and... Uh, that's right. ...took over the live airs. Yes, and, and the... It was almost like he was... Uh, he started off um, uh, the road show as a roadie. Right, the CFMY Road Show, which was quite popular in the, in the Martin 80s. was a roadie for the CFMY yeah. Road Show? Okay. That's how he got it started. And then just kind of put himself... He worked his way, worked his way into the radio station, and Martin was always a character. I went to high school with Martin. I, know, yeah. I, I knew him since grade nine. He was the president of the student body, and, and, he, and he never got out of grade nine. You know, much to the chagrin of the, the principal... You know, this guy got elected to the student body president. He was—he should have been in grade thirteen, but he was in grade nine, right? <laughs> and he'd go to the football. He was—he was a great, you know, yeah. master for the high school. He'd, he'd have one of those megaphones, megaphones, and he'd, he'd be the whole thing. He, had, yeah. he fired the school up, man. He was good at that. Right? He had a great voice. He projected. So he burned very bright. Back in the back in the ni- early nineties, you know, we we bring bringing a DJ to a club was a big thing. Yeah. So when we opened up Fever, you know, we had this night called Monday Night Fever. It was an alternative night, and we brought Martin out. So it was Monday Night Fever with Martin Street, and that went on for like 10 years. At what club? Fever. Fever, yeah. Right? Yeah. Well, and, uh, we brought him Nicholas in. Nicholas Pickles. We, we, yeah, Nicholas Pickles. Uh, we brought him into uh, he never to, aged. to NRG, and then that's when we sold it in 95, and he stayed there, right? Yeah. And he did the live there there for years. Yeah. But uh, Martin, you know, he was part of the family, right? He really was. Him, him and my brother used to go skiing together, mm-hmm. and uh, me and Martin used to hang out socially, you know, after work at times. And I remember the one night he brought Marilyn Manson to the club, and this is before Marilyn Manson was... Yeah. Nobody knew who Marilyn Manson was except the people at Monday Night Fever, right? <laughs> it's so crazy. So this guy, yeah. Mr. Goth himself, showed up, right? And, uh, you know, and it was pretty cool because he was a real gentleman. He, you know, he was nothing like his persona that sure. he was on TV, and... Uh, I'll never forget the interaction I had with him. You know, he said, I was there that night. He said he was from Miami. I said, oh, you're from Miami. And I, being the sarcastic dude that I was, I said, oh, so you golf, because I'm a golfer. I was just getting a, a fax from my golf course for yeah. some reason. I'm in there with Marilyn Manson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He goes, That's no. funny. And then he That's goes, funny. He's a, he and likes comedy. He's I go, so do you golf? He goes, no, I'm mini putt with a straight face. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. And, and Martin told that story at my wedding, right? That he's, one, that he, I asked Marilyn Manson to be golfed. He's a, He's got a sense of humor. Yeah. And that's the thing, you know, the onstage persona is like no, it's a, a nail bomb. Yeah, he's a real cool cat. He's, he was a good yeah. guy, right? He, you know, there was no ego there, and he was just he was enjoying his time there. And it's Hamilton. refreshing. Yeah. Especially on your give a shit list, Marilyn Manson's feelings are probably at the bottom right. of it, right? <laughs> yeah. So to kind of, you know, he knows that you know that he, you don't give a fuck, right. but you're not a full-blown asshole, but you're going to give him a chance to be a nice guy right. or a bad guy. Right. Yeah, there's... Yeah, you can see that. He's one of, he's one of the boys. You know, he can chirp. You know, you know, you know when you chirp your buddies, right? You know, oh, I, guys don't sit around. I mean, and go, oh, your hair looks so good today. Yeah, no. Oh, I love your outfit. You know, guys aren't like that, right? Guys, they chirp each other, right? I rip their assholes. <laughs> I've ended. <laughs> I've ended so many friendships. Just the guys can't take it. Right. They break. Yeah, they break. They're too sensitive. Yeah. Too sensitive. Their tampon strings are hanging out, and I'm kneeling on well, it. Bless their little hearts, Jay. Right. On tampon strings. Rest in peace, Martin yes. Streak. Thanks for being on the show. Uh, come out to the shows, Edmonton, Calgary, uh, maybe something in Vancouver, and um, Oshawa, and 
we did Burlington was sold out. So yeah, come out to the Hamilton show and uh, we'll and come, come out to laugh. Come out to laugh and come out to Koi. And you got a yeah. kitchen here? Yes, we do. We have, we have a menu, yeah. What do you got on the menu? Uh, just uh, pub fare, you know, yeah. burgers, fries. Cool, cool. It's all good. Come and eat. Thank you. Bye. I don't care what society thinks. Good or nothing anyway.